Hello, this is the Radical Reviewer taking a look at Snowpiercer, directed by Bong John Ao, released in the US in 2014, based on the graphic novel Le Trompaner Sonage. I figured I should take a look at this film on its own after mentioning it briefly in my Animal Farm review. The key idea of this film is a critique on modern society. All of humanity lives on a train, which is a class-based, self-contained system. A biodome meets in time, if you will. The film is about the actions, ideologies, actors, and motivations involved in corrupt systems and revolution. Let's take a look at the film in depth. Spoilers ahead. Firstly, the cause of the dystopian future is a metaphor for the entire story. Humanity faces global warming, and rather than change human behavior to coincide with nature, civilized society decides to flood the atmosphere with chemicals, which in turn causes the Earth to plummet into an ice age. This mirrors the story because the train is maintained through human-imposed so-called natural preordained order, which is in fact not so perfect and is a decaying and eroding system. But I'm getting ahead of myself. First, the film introduces the tail section of the train, which is an utter destitution. They are managed by assault rifle wielding soldiers. Very militarized ghetto, third world dictatorship, District 9 style. We see right off the bat that the people of the tail section are seen as chattel, or worse. They're counted as animals and referred to as a resource. For example, one soldier says... Not both? Yes, both hands. When looking at the protein blocks for a secret message, which is the tail section's key to the outside world, a young boy named Timmy has it and will only trade it for the ball, symbolizing their lack of anything but the bare necessities. What's more important here, though, is the boy says, in the whole wide train. In the whole wide train? In the whole wide train. Showing that people, especially train babies, Look at the outside of the train the way we look at a world without capitalism. There's just nothing out there. The train is it. Tina, there is no alternative. This message is hit home further when Curtis says, We control the engine, we control the world. Sp Speaking of Curtis, let's look at the relationship of three of our main protagonists. Edgar idealizes Curtis as a natural revolutionary leader, a Che Guevara character, if you will. And Curtis idealizes Gilliam as the philosophical brains of resistance, along the lines of a Karl Marx. Gilliam, by the way, is a reference to Kerry Gilliam, who has directed such dystopian films as Brazil and Twelve Monkeys. Back to the story. Two children are taken, again, as resources from the tail section, and the father of one lashes out and throws a shoe at the leader Wilfred, second in command. This is where we meet the character Mason, who corrects this disobedient behavior by freezing the man's arm outside the train. Mason is a mouthpiece of power, like Squealer for those who are familiar with Animal Farm. Apparently, Mason was originally written to be played by John C. Riley, which would have been pretty interesting. Anyways, Mason is a mouthpiece of authority and the dominant ideology, and fanatically adheres to Wilfred, the train, the preordained order, all of it. She uses a contorted hand gesture key motion in her speech, which symbolizes the mechanical way those in power depict the natural order of things. This is the cutting the foot to fit the shoe. That is, humans treating nature as mechanical to their own demise. Derek Jensen has referred to violence and hierarchy, saying that violence cannot go up the hierarchy. For example, if a factory cuts corners, which results in employee deaths, that's merely an accident, which would result in a minor suit. But if a protester breaks a company window as an act of protest, they're a terrorist inciting a riot. We see the same thing here. The man who threw the shoe, a minor act, is punished by having his entire arm removed. Mason and the other higher-ups are very pleased and amused with the brutality. The act is met with paternalistic musing from Mason, comparing the act of throwing the shoe to chaos and death, stating this. This is not a shoe. This is disorder. This is size 10 chaos. This, see this? This is death. An, an artist draws the show trial taking place, and it is shown that the artist has depicted many of the historical events on the train. This is the proletariat's social history. The artist is creating social memory. After this, Gilliam tells Mason that he and Wilfred need to talk. Mason says Wilfred has no reason to come back here. 
This shows that Mason, the mouthpiece, sees the hierarchy of the train at face value and doesn't know the inner workings of power. For example, that Gilliam and Wilfred speak regularly. Revolution breaks out and the tail section people begin moving up the train. They stop at a jail section and release Namgung, a security specialist who will open train doors for them in exchange for the drug Chrono. The fact that Namgung is middle class is important here and I'll address that later. There are windows in the next car and the tail sectioners see outside for the first time in years. Seeing the outside is useless, however, they can't go out there, so there's no point in looking. I believe Nerdwriter addressed this point well, so I don't need to go into it here. The following room is where the protein blocks are made. Sure, it's important that the protein blocks are made from bugs, and that the worker of the machine eats them too, so he has accepted the station in life and accepted that the protein blocks are made from bugs. But the real thing to notice here is that he has to work much of the machine himself because many parts have gone extinct. The next car is full of masked soldiers carrying melee weapons, and a brutal fight occurs. The fighting is stopped while the soldiers count down to the Happy New Year. This is, this is similar to Slavoj Žižek's analogy of pure indoctrination of ideology, where a train operator will insist on collecting tickets on a runaway train. Even though an uprising is occurring, mass brutality is breaking out. In the midst of all this, they cling to the celebratory and ritualistic nature of their ideology. This is followed by the tail sectioners and soldiers bracing for impact as the train hits an ice buildup. This displays that regardless of what is going on inside the train, they are susceptible to the conditions of the outside world. Other films have addressed this, such as The Experiment or Castaway, where the outside world destroys the audience and the actor's immersion by reminding them that the outside world has greater impact than what's going on inside. The brutal fighting continues again. Mason and the other higher-ups enjoy the brutality, rolling gladiator style. In the fighting, Edgar is captured and Mason is wounded, and Curtis must decide if he is to go backward and save Edgar, or push forward and stop Mason. His, un his understanding of the struggle tells him to push forward at all costs, and so Curtis captures Mason, and Edgar is abandoned and killed. Mason and Curtis have an exchange, and it comes out that Wilfred knows about Curtis and Edgar and has been keeping an eye on them. It also comes out that there is no middle portion of the train worth taking over, that only taking over the engine will secure the revolution. This is along the lines of the Dead Prez lyric, takeover, not a makeover, that piecemeal reforms will not solve the injustices, systemic change is needed. As they continue up the train, they come to an aquarium and they eat sushi. Two important things happen here. One, Mason justifies the inequality as a burden of the natural order, stating that not only do they get to eat sushi, but they have to eat sushi. It is their duty to maintain the ecological balance. This is similar to a capitalist saying, well, I don't want to exploit my workers and be rich, but I have to for my shareholders. It's a burden. The other thing to note here is as they eat sushi, they pass a frozen harbor covered in strewn about cargo ships, the wreckage of humans' attempt to control nature in the past. It's understood that they are eating the only fish available in the world. Like the book and movie The Road, they know that the luxuries they are experiencing are the last glimpses of what civilization used to be. One of the next cars is a school. The ideology and indoctrination get pretty hammy here, but it is to serve a purpose. The kids explain that tail section people are lazy, stupid, and sleep in their own shit. In the real world, the poor are rarely explicitly looked at in this way, but the movie is saying explicitly what is said implicitly, in a they live kind of way. Our society treats the poor in the US and the world as if we do think that they are stupid and lazy. The plight of the poor is misunderstood, hierarchy is instilled, and the children's world is framed according to the dominant narrative. Like Plato's allegory of the cave, they are taught that the shadows are the reality. 
Here also, just as in the real world, various protests and rebellious acts are seen as hectic, lacking in vision, ill-founded, etc. The children are shown the revolution of the seven, in which seven people tried to stop the train, but were frozen when they escaped. The children are taught that escaping the train is death, stopping the train is death. Tina, there is no alternative. Outside the train, we all freeze and die. If the engine stops running, we'd all die. And who takes care of the sacred engine? Gun Guns are produced, and Gilliam is killed, and so Curtis kills Mason in response. Now, Mason's bodyguard and Curtis have a vendetta against each other, like the timekeeper cop and the protagonist from the movie In Time. One is the leader of the poor, the other is a servant of the rich. Their station in life is similar, but the guard is a loyal tool of the oppressor. We see this in real life as cops beat up and pepper spray protesters for the crime of criticizing those in power. The hierarchy is further established here as the bodyguard kills a front-end passenger and is harshly criticized even though he has killed several tail section passengers without mention. As the tail sectioners pass the final cars, it is pure luxury and high-class partying as the windows are replaced with TV screens, showing that they, too, have blocked out the outside world. Finally, they are at the final gate. They have made it to the engine. Nam Goom and Curtis sit and explain their goals and motivations to each other. Curtis explains that in the beginning, the tail section was full of starvation and cannibalism, and that Curtis killed a woman in order to eat her baby. But then, Gilliam took the knife and cut off his own arm and offered it in exchange for the baby's life. The baby was Edgar. Here we see the dynamic between the three characters. Curtis was willing to attack and consume his own people for survival, which is what Wilfred and the dominant class want. Yet Gilliam sacrifices himself. Protection, promotion, and survival of their social class is through sacrificing for each other rather than violence towards each other. This is a classic theory behind labor struggle. Nam Goong explains that what he showed his daughter outside the window in an earlier scene was the wing of a plane that he noticed was covered in less and less snow every year as they passed it. Out of anyone in the story, Nam Goong is the only one looking outside the train for answers to their problems. Again, like Plato's cave, everyone thinks there is no alternative. But Nam Goong has been looking outside the train for answers. He explains that he has been saving Chrono, not because he's an addict to the drug, but because it is explosive. And rather than blow the door to the front of the train, he wants to blow a door out the side of the train and get out. The peasants and proletariats of the tail section have limited knowledge of the train and the world, and so only seek to move forward and gain control of the current system. They only think to work within the system that they are in. This is where Nam Goong being middle class comes in. Like the BPP, many socialist radical leaders, and even though I don't agree with or support this last group, terrorist organizations in the Middle East, they are not made up of the poor who are suffering injustice and have no resources or means to fight back. Instead, they are typically educated, lower middle class people who identify with and sympathize with those facing oppression. They are the ones leading rebellion. Rather than rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic, as the saying goes, Nangum sees that the only real solution to change the system is to escape it completely. However, Nangum is stopped and Curtis enters the engine and Wilford and Curtis then talk about their motivations and ideological differences. Wilford explains that Curtis is the only person who has been in every car of the train. Wilfred does the hand key gesture motion that Mason had used, symbolizing nature as mechanical. Wolford explains that he has organized various rebellions over the years for the purpose of population and psychological control. This is similar to the conversation between Neo and the Architect in the Matrix franchise, but the concept is handled better here because we've seen the revolution play out and we've been given some history about revolutions in the past, so the context is more immersive here. Wilfred explains that he and Gilliam have been working together to ensure stability and that Gilliam was killed because the plan wasn't supposed to involve 
the deaths of head section passengers. This causes Curtis to falter in his beliefs, much in the way a person who might ideologically follow a political candidate, but then become disheartened when in the end that candidate falls in line with the status quo. Wilford explains that he has been the informant passing the secret notes to the tail section, much like how in our society stool pigeons will infiltrate a workers union to make it ineffective, or an undercover cop will infiltrate a protest and commit acts that will give the police an excuse to shut the protest down. Then Wilfred states his ideology directly. I've devoted my entire life to this. The eternal engine. It is eternity itself. Wilfred, ex Wilfred explains that he is old and that he and Gilliam want Curtis to take over the train. To indoctrinate Curtis further, Wilfred addresses the fighting that is taking place in the train and comparing it to the chaos of the early days in the tail section. Curtis can stop the chaos and maintain the train because he has lived chaos. He has seen every car in the train and should see, Tina, there is no alternative. Curtis is starting to believe it. He sees the pure calculations of the clean engine section and starts to come over to Wilfred's interpretation of the train and society. Because Curtis only sees things within the existing system, it is easy to get him to buy into the dominant narrative's perspective. But then, Nam Goom's daughter, Yona, opens the floorboards and reveals Timmy, one of the small boys taken from the tail section in the beginning of the movie, is crammed inside the floor and has replaced part of the train that has gone extinct. Curtis realizes Nam Goom's ideas were correct. The current system is decaying. The decaying protein block maker, the one-stringed violin in the classroom scene, and even the engine itself is decaying and parts are becoming extinct. The system is not sustainable, and the only way to escape is to fully escape the train. He uses his arm to block the machine and help Timmy escape, and he finally lives up to his ideals of Gilliam and loses his arm to save humanity. Wilfred uses the key hand gesture a final time and says that everyone has their preordained position. In the end, Wilfred still justifies the current established order and refuses to see other options. The blast on the door causes an avalanche, and many people are presumed to have died as the train is derailed and rolls down the mountain. Like Bob's sacrifice in Fight Club or Derek Jensen's ideas of revolution, both of whom have explained that current systems are already destructive and so ending those systems will cause death. For example, you can't have industrial society without death from factory injuries, industrial chemicals, and starvation. Yet, you can't end industrial civilization without deaths from lack of necessary food, transportation, medical equipment, etc. The movie ends with Yona and Timmy, the two train babies, wrapped in fur coats being the first people to step off the train and survive. They see a polar bear in the distance and it seems that the world is returning back to normal, returning back to nature. To finish my analysis, I want to explain how this film changed how I think. The movie is definitely cheesy and hammy at parts. Like I said before, it's a critique of our current society and so it is making explicit what is so often implicit. This is one of my favorite movies. I love it because it's a lot of radical theory all combined into one movie. You have Wilfred, the corrupt system clinging to the decaying ideology. You have Mason, the mouthpiece of power, fanatically following the corrupt system even though she knows nothing of its inner workings. You have the bodyguards, who are exploited by power but still fight the proletariat and protect the powerful. You have the bourgeoisie, who live in opulence, sealed off from the poor, and sealed off from the outside world alike. You have the tail sectioners, who give their limbs and children, literally, as exploited resources for the system. You have the poor artists, recording the social history of class struggle. You have Gilliam and Curtis, the revolutionary thinkers, working and thinking within the current system to improve it. And you have Nangum and Yona, revolutionaries thinking outside the system. I absolutely recommend this film. I recommend it to everyone. If you're interested in radical theory, looking for a movie recommendation or whatever, you can get your radical reviews here with the Radical Reviewer. Thanks for watching.